It was the day after I read A Court of Wings and Ruin, the last book of the Avatar trilogy by Sarah J. Mass. I fled across the country to start a new life. One for freedom. And for hope. But there are some things that you can't leave behind. <laughs> that can't be right. This is a trilogy, meaning that there's only three books and I'm done with it. <laughs> Why would there be an extra book in a series unless it's a... No. No. This can't be real. They're fucking lying to you. There are only three books in the series. You've read all three of them. It's over. It's not true. It's not true. It's just a dream. This is just a dream. This is a dream. It's just a very, very bad dream. You put in your time. You put in your energy. You gave up all your brain cells for this, and now you're supposed to live a good life. It's not true. It's not. Listen, Resan has always emphasized that it is your choice. So if you were a true Resan fan, then you would check out the sponsor of this video. Choices is a game that you can download on your phone for free where you get to be in control of your own story. You basically get an access to a library of different stories to play around with. And so they vary from falling in love to solving crimes to embarking on fantasy adventures. Maybe there's even some steamy scenes too, at least from what I saw when I played the game. It's basically like reading a book except you get to actually decide what the main character does. So you have a choice whether you want her to be a dumb bitch or actually be smart about it. All the games in the library have a very engaging storyline, it has high quality art and writing, and it has a lot of really cute outfits and characters that you can customize. You can try the game by clicking on the link in my description. The game that I played is called Bloodbound and it's basically a story where I'm applying for a job with this CEO billionaire. It's like this urban fantasy slash romance slash sexy vampire thriller, which you know I'm all about. Not only could I customize the character that I was playing, but I could also customize love interests. So I got to decide whether I wanted him to be a pasty white boy or a sensual chocolate man, or just in between with a racially ambiguous hottie. We love diverse options. Once again, you can try the game by clicking the link in my description. Now let's get on with the rest of the video. If you're new here, the Akatar series is a fantasy YA series about a girl who gets dicked down by a bunch of fairies. Fairies are basically like humans, but with magic and big dicks. The first book is a Beauty and Beast retelling. The main character is Feyre. She falls in love with a fairy named Tamlin. Feyre becomes a fairy in the end. They live happily ever after, except they don't because in book two, Tamlin turns out to be abusive. So now she runs away into the arms of another fairy named Rhysand. He was kind of the bad guy in the first book, but now in the second book, he turns out to be a misunderstood feminist and he has a bigger dick. So we're all just rooting for him now. The book ends with Feyre's two sisters, Elaine and Nessa falling into a cauldron that turns them into fairies. There are these two other male fairies that are really attracted to them. So it's like this big fairy orgy that's going on. In the third book, there's a war, there's some sex. Sometimes there's both because Feyre gives a blowjob to Rhysand in the middle of the war while other people are dying around them. And she's like, you know what? I can have the best of both worlds. And then in the last 100 pages, there's a random side character that comes out as bisexual. The last video that I did, I made the mistake of saying that she was a lesbian. That was my bad. She's actually bisexual because she's attracted to both men and women. Women, but given the fact that she talked about how much she was attracted to women for six whole pages of monologue, I got kind of confused there. But to clarify, she is bi and I am still homophobic. The war ends, Feyre forgives Tamlin for being abusive. She and Rhysand become rulers of the night court and they live happily ever after, live, love, laugh. 
the end. If you would like to hear me talk about the books individually, I will have a link in my description with a playlist for each review of each book. This video is dedicated to the novella, which takes place after the series is over. It's kind of like a Christmas special about Feyre and all the other fairies and how they spend their Christmas. A lot of people did not like this novella. Even the fans did not like this novella. You're telling me that people who are willing to read three books of Feyre getting digged down by fairies will draw the line at this book? Sounds kind of dicey. But I was optimistic because a common criticism for this book seemed to be that nothing happens in it and there's no plot, which sounded like a good thing to me. Because if you watch my previous videos, the main criticism that I had was that there was too much attempts at plot going on and not enough smut scenes. I'm not here for the plot, okay? I'm here for the Dick. And as much as people acted like the series was some trashy erotica, I was over here going a bitch where. I was promised smut and instead I get 500 pages of a badly written plot, some vague idea about a war going on, character assassination instead of development, and then I only see a dick like two times. So with this Christmas book, I was like, dude, bring it on. I am ready to ho 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 it up. It's the holidays. What gift are they going to give to each other? STDs? I don't know. This is an exciting time. Anything can happen. I was ready to see some jingle balls. I was ready to see some party poppers pussy pop. I was like, dude, it's December. Let's end the year with a bang. But instead, I get some vanilla ass bullshit. The only balls I see Farrah playing around with are snowballs. And frankly, I am disgusted at the caucasity because not once did I ever see anybody climb up anyone's chimney. What was all this for, if not for that? What was all this for? There were some sex scenes, but they were so little and spread out in between all these other boring ass scenes that Farrah might as well have been the Virgin Mary herself. It's a fucking Christmas miracle, bitch. This takes place after the war is over. The fairies are gonna celebrate with the winter solstice, but despite the festive atmosphere, Farrah cannot keep the shadows of the past from looming because it turns out there are some scars that can't heal like her hymen. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. She has a legit point because when a war is over, it's not actually over. Whenever there's a war, there are a lot of people who get displaced. There are lots of veterans who fought in the war, who deal with mental issues that come from the trauma of fighting in the war, and they have to deal with PTSD for the rest of their lives. And oftentimes, their own country that they fought for don't even help them rehabilitate afterward. A lot of Farrah's concerns in this book parallel with how oftentimes veterans get abandoned. It parallels how there is insufficient funding to take care of people whose lives get displaced, and over Overall, the physical and mental toll that victims have to deal with following the repercussions of a great war. So I'm glad that there's a young adult book that sheds light on these issues and there's a conscientious main character that young girls can look up to in that respect. That being said, she did suck a dick in the middle of the war while everybody was dying in the third book, so I'm not sure why there's a change of heart. Because now in this book, she's just like, man, I wish I could do something for all these people. How can I be happy when there's so many people suffering out in the world? I'm like, yeah, that would have been nice to think about while you were sucking that dick in book three, but you didn't. I don't know, maybe you could have just went outside your tent and just helped a veteran out. Because when you're giving a blowjob, I'm pretty sure it wasn't for the troops. I'm just saying. God bless America. And then we also get Rhysand's point of view. And man, if you thought he was woke in the other two books, just wait till you actually see his train of thought in this book. In book two, Rhysand saves Feyre from an abusive relationship by constantly emphasizing that it is her choice, thereby giving her a sense of agency, which is all that we really want a man to give us. He constantly emphasizes that it is her choice and it is her decision. Although in book one, he did pimp her out against her consent, but we're not gonna talk about that. And then in book three, it is revealed that he actually has a covent for pre who have been sexually assaulted and now that acts as a safe space and recluse for them. Although in the next chapter, he did suggest fucking Feyre in the same safe space where people have been sexually assaulted, but we're also gonna ignore that. So what is he gonna do in the novella? Well, prepare to have your socks blown off right away in the beginning when we get his perspective. He starts thinking about all of the male warriors who go out training and fighting and all the women who have to stay at home to tend to their husbands. Their required tasks whether old or young, remain the same. Cooking, cleaning, child rearing, clothes making, laundry. There was honor in such tasks, pride and good work to be found in them, but not when every single one of the females here was expected to do it. And if they shirked those duties, either one of the half dozen camp mothers or whatever males controlled their lives would punish them. Change was slower than the melting glaciers scattered amongst these mountains. Traditions going back thousands of years left mostly unchallenged until us, until now. Woke King. Rhysand was like, you know what? I don't think all women 
should cook. But not only that, there are other male fairies who start to get woke just like him. One of the guys says, the boys need a nice solstice after all they endured. Let the girls give one to them. To which Cassian, one of the male fairies, replies, the boys can help decorate, clean, and cook. They've got two hands. Cassian said, you know what? Maybe sometimes the men should cook. Oh my god, it's like women have two hands but men have two hands too. So it's like in a way, we're all equal. As we all know, feminism makes Rhysand horny, so he quickly shifts over to thinking about digging down Feyre. Last week had been so stupidly busy and I had been so desperate for the feel and taste of her that I had taken her during the flight down from the House of Wind to the townhouse, high above Valeris, for all to see. It had required some careful maneuvering and I had planned it for months now on actually making a moment of it. But with her against me like that, alone in the skies, all they had taken was one look into those blue-gray eyes and I was unfastening her pants. A moment later, I had been inside her and had nearly sent us crashing into the rooftops like an Ilrian whelp. These two had sex in the sky. You're telling me that he planned this for months now just to figure out the mechanics of how that would work? First of all, I don't know how you can do this without any leverage. But second of all, in the sky? <laughs> twice as high take a look it's in a book a reading rainbow these two nearly crash into people's rooftops again how are you going to be so concerned about people's welfare and people being displaced from homes and then also nearly crash into those people's homes you're being sad about how some people don't have roofs over their heads meanwhile you almost nearly destroy a roof with your giant cock and all fairy had to do was laugh to make him climax honestly she is powerful that's true feminism for you Rizan shows a sensitive side a few pages later when he talks to Cassia he's starting to have doubts about Feyre and why she chose him she's turning 21 21 Cassian. To which Cassian replies, So, your mother was 18 to your father's 900. Hashtag love is love. When we switch back to Feyre, she's checking out the ruins in the night court and seeing all of the destroyed houses. A few months ago, I had begun donating a portion of my monthly salary. The idea of receiving such a thing was so utterly ludicrous to rebuilding the rainbow and helping its artists. But the scars remained on both these buildings and their residents. And the mound of snow-dusted rubble before me, who had dwelt there, worked there, did they live or had they been slaughtered in the attack? First of all, why does this bitch have a salary? What is the economy in fairyland that would even constitute anyone having a salary here? Second of all, you're looking at the rubble of people's houses that were destroyed. So why are you having sex with your boyfriend in the middle of the sky and nearly fucking up the rare houses that do still remain? Seems kind of insensitive to a socioeconomic climate around you, just saying. And then she hears someone speak up from the ruins. They they got out in time, a female voice said behind me. Oh, thank God they got out in time before Rhysand's massive cock crashed into the rooftop. You know it was a close one because Pharaoh was laughing a lot. I fumbled for words for something high lady-ish and yet accessible and came up empty, came up so empty that I blurted, it's snowing, as if the drifting veils of white could be anything else. The fairy inclined her head again. It is. She smiled at the sky, snow catching in her inky hair. A fine first snow at that. You see how bad it is, Farah? Not only are these people homeless, they're also only capable of having boring ass conversations because they don't have homes or a personality. This is how bad it's been, Farah. It's time to get woke like your husband. There's a group of us who paint together at my studio one night a week. We're meeting in two days time. It would be an honor if you joined us. What sort of things do you paint? My question was soft as the snow falling past us. Racina smiled slightly. The things that need telling. You know, Farrah has painted in every single book, and to this day, I still don't know what this bitch paints. And it cuts to a future time where Farrah has a conversation with some of the other fairies about how wealthy they are. More smirked. You do know that we're well off, don't you? You could fill a bathtub with those things. She jerked her chin toward the egg-sized sapphire in the window of the jewelry shop and barely make a dent in our accounts. I had seen the list of assets. I still couldn't wrap my mind around the enormity of Reese's wealth, my wealth. It didn't feel real, those numbers and figures, like it was children's play money. 
I only bought what I needed. It is emphasized so many times how humble Feyre is because she doesn't see the need for excessive wealth. She's like, oh, I don't need this. Oh, I shouldn't take this. I only buy what I need. I'm like, okay, bitch, good for you. But it's very clear that the author wants to position Feyre as like this saint who is so humble and so sweet and so caring for all her people. And we're barely like 40 pages in. But you know, maybe that is still realistic. After all, she did forgive Tamlin at the end of the third book. Risa and Feyre spent the entire series hating on Tamlin and making him seem like he was the most awful character that ever existed, only for the very end to be like, you know what? I hope you're happy. I genuinely wish nothing but the best for you. Did that development come out of nowhere? Yes, but at least it's a sign for emotional maturity and closure. So I get what she was trying to do with that until we get to this part where Resan sees Tamlin. You nearly destroyed her in every way possible. Tamlin bared his teeth. I bared mine back. Temper be damned. Let some of my power rumble through the room, the house, the grounds. She survived it though, survived you. And you still felt the need to humiliate her, belittle her. If you meant to win her back, old friend, that wasn't the wisest route. Tanlin replies, get out. But Rhysand still continues. I wasn't finished. Not even close. You deserve everything that has befallen you. You deserve this pathetic, empty house, your ravaged lands. I don't care if you offer that kernel of life to save me. I don't care if you still love my mate. I don't care that you saved her from Hybrid or a thousand enemies before that. The words poured out, cold and steady. I hope you live the rest of your miserable life alone here. It's a far more satisfying end than slaughtering you. Bitch, what the fuck happened? I thought we were all about forgiveness. Tis the season, bitch. This is not the Christmas spirit that you guys have been preaching about. What was the whole point of the ending in the third book if you were gonna go ahead and verbally demolish him here? Tamlin has nothing left. He has no friends, no wife. His house is empty. His land is ruined. But Rhysand goes in his empty house and it's like, you know what? Fuck you. You were never shit. You ain't shit. And you would never be shit. Your own mother never loved you. Nobody will care that you ever existed, you worthless sack of shit. And I'm like, dude, stop. <laughs> Stop, he's already dead. <laughs> Let me take a pause right here to rant about Tamlin. Yes, he is an asshole. Yes, he is a terrible character. But what I don't understand is why we're acting like every other character was not also an asshole. Why is it that every book we seem to pile him on, just beat the shit out of him verbally as if he was like the worst person that ever walked on earth, as if the other characters didn't do shit. Tamlin was a nice guy in the first book and then after the events in the end, ending of the first book, he was clearly dealing with PTSD, which is something similar that Pharaoh is dealing with. The difference is that Pharaoh's PTSD made her a vulnerable heroine. Tamlin's PTSD makes him a villain. So why is it that we're supposed to sympathize for Pharaoh dealing with her PTSD and her own inner demons, but with Tamlin, we're like, oh, go fuck yourself. And we act like he has no room for redemption whatsoever. It's especially hypocritical considering that the war is just done. Now Pharaoh is being sad over all these veterans who sacrifice their lives for the war, there's definitely gotta be people who have PTSD. But again, fuck Tamlin. I just think it's super weird that we are all dogpiling on this character while everyone else is just like a saint. I don't know. It doesn't sound like a very Christmas spirit to me. A few pages later, Rhysan talks about it to Feyre and he says, I should have been the bigger male. To which she replies, you're the bigger male most days. You're entitled to a slip up. She smiled broadly, bright as the full moon, lovelier than any star. I kissed her cheek, breathing in her lilac and pear scent. I have some errands that need tending to, and looking at her, walking beside her, did little to cool the rage that still roiled in me. Not when that beautiful smile made me want to winnow back to the spring court and punch my Illyrian blade through Tamlin's gut. Bigger male indeed. <laughs> Bitch, <laughs> he's not even in the scene. Now you're making fun of his dick size? Like, <laughs> leave him alone. I'm not team Tamlin, but I'm just saying they need to stop because this poor boy's already dead. And the last thing that Risen says before he leaves is, go paint my nude portrait, I told her, winking and shot into the bitterly cold sky. I could have spent my whole life without reading that. Yes, there is a lot of innuendo throughout the novella. However, I argue that there has been no actual scene where they bang. They did talk about banging in the sky, but that was just like a passing thought and it wasn't a drawn out scene. So I'm just like, okay, it's been a hundred pages. 
where the hell is the dick? And then the author continues to insult me even more with this entire page dedicated to this dialogue. Amran hissed at him, her dark hair swaying like a curtain of liquid night. Do you know what an inconvenience it is to need to find a place to relieve myself everywhere I go? Reese drawled to Amran. Shall we start building public toilets for you throughout Valeris, Amran? I mean it, Reese Sand, Amran snapped. Amran waved a hand down at herself. I should have selected a male form. At least you can whip it out and go wherever you like without having to worry about spilling on Cassian lost it then more than me and even A's chuckling faintly you really don't know how to pee more roared after all this time tell me you know how a toilet works Cassian burst out slapping a broad hand on the table tell me you know that much I clapped a hand over my mouth as if it would push the laugh back in across the table Reese's eyes were brighter than stars his mouth a quivering line as he tried and failed to remain serious I know how to sit on a toilet Amron growled ha 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 oh what silly banter what a knee slapper. What a funny, silly little story between this found family. <laughs> Enough. You wasted my time with this banter between this boring ass found family. They're laughing and joking about pee and not even once did we see a golden shower scene. Disgusting. Speaking of scenes that wasted my time, Favor is at the market and she finds a weaver who makes these beautiful tapestries. I wanted to know about the tapestry with the insignia, the black fabric. What is it? I get asked that at least once an hour. I call it void. It absorbs the light, creates a complete lack of color. You made it, Elaine asked, now staring over her shoulder toward the tapestry. A solemn nod, a newer experiment of mine to see how darkness might be made, woven, to see if I could take it farther, deeper than any weaver has before. Her gray eyes shifted toward me again. My husband didn't return from the war. The frank open words clanged through me. It was an effort to hold her gaze as she continued. I began trying to create void the day after I learned he had fallen. He thought it was right to help fight. He left with several others who felt the same and joined up with a summer court legion they found on their way south. He died in the battle for Adriata. I'm sorry, I said softly. I thought we'd have a thousand more years together. In the 300 years we were wed, we never had the chance to have children. I don't even have a piece of him in that way. He's gone, and I am not. Void was born of that feeling. I keep hoping that every time I tell someone who asks about Void, it will get easier. The silver thread, Elaine asked. What is it called? The weaver paused the loom again, the colorful strings vibrating. She held my sister's gaze. No attempt at a smile this time. I call it hope. My throat became unbearably tight, my eyes seeing enough that I had to turn away to walk back toward that extraordinary tapestry. The weaver explained to my sister, I made it after I mastered Void. I stared and stared at the black fabric that was like peering into a pit of hell, and then stared at the iridescent living silver thread that cut through it, bright despite the darkness that devoured all other light and color. I gestured to the loom, the half-finished piece taking form on his frame. How do you keep creating despite what you lost? The weaver went on, I have to create, or it was all for nothing. I have to create, or I will crumple up with despair and never leave my bed. I have to create, because I have no other way of voice this. Her hand rested on her heart and my eyes burned. It is hard, the weaver said, her stare never leaving mine. And it hurts, but if I were to stop, if I were to let this loom or the spindle go silent, then there would be no hope shining in the void. Oh my god, it's like the tapestry named Void represents void and the tapestry named Hope represents hope hope. This is the kind of scene where you have to read so many times in order to get the true symbolism of what this weaver is talking about. It's like what she's weaving parallels the situation that she was in and the grief that she dealt with her husband and she's able to like put that as an outlet in the thing that she's making but the art represents life so it's like from life comes art and from art comes life because if she didn't keep creating then there would be no hope in the void. Get it? Because the tapestry is also called hope and the other tapestry is called void and it's like dude it's talking about life listen if you get it you get it but if you don't get woke my mouth trembled and the weaver reached over to squeeze my hand i had no words to offer her nothing to convey what surged in my chest nothing other than I would like to buy that tapestry. Next, we switch over to Rhysand's perspective where he's talking to Cassian, and I tabbed a part where Cassian says, the females bring their jewelry. 
I bring my weapons. Cassian, didn't you just say in like the second chapter that men should cook too? So what happens with that development? Your feminism is kind of inconsistent. It's okay, we can't all be at resense level. Then we get to another scene from Vera's perspective. More drags her out outside and she's like, hey, come with me, you gotta check this out. More pointed to the endless field atop the mountain, covered in snow just like I had last seen it, but rather than a flat, uninterrupted expanse, dot, 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 are those? Snow forts? Something white shot across the field, white and hard and glistening. And then Cassia's yowl echoed off the mountains around us, followed by, you bastard! Rhysand's answering laugh was bright as the sun on snow. Three Illyrian warriors, I said. The greatest Illyrian warriors are having a snowball fight. Mora's eyes practically glowed with wicked delight since they were children. They're over 500 years old. Do you want me to tell you the running tally of victories? <sighs> Do you see what I mean with this vanilla ass bullshit? I have to read a whole page of a snowball fight and not once did I see actual balls. Only action I'm seeing is a goddamn snowball fight. You're telling me that you started the scene with something white and hard and glistening and it wasn't even a fairy peen? This is the most disappointing Christmas I have ever experienced. Even the next chapter has like a very slight reference to the nasty images that they sent to each other, but again, no detail. My lips curved as I sent him an image, a memory, of me on the kitchen table just a few feet away, of him kneeling before me, my legs wrapped around his head. <laughs> I heard a door slamming somewhere in the house, followed by a distinctly male yelp, then banging as if someone was trying to get back inside. Moore's eyes sparkled. You got him kicked out, didn't you? My answering smile set her roaring. And then that's it. You were on the kitchen table. Your legs were wrapped around his head. What else? <laughs> That's how I pictured it, by the way, because I have no other thing to base it on. Finally, we get to the part where Resand and Feyre exchange gifts with each other. Rhys opened my present carefully, lifting the painting so the others wouldn't see it. I watched his eyes rove over what was on it, watched his throat bob. Rhys's face remained solemn, his eyes start bright as they met mine. Thank you. I have no idea where you might hang it, I said, but I wanted you to have it, to see. For on that painting, I had shown him what I had not revealed to anyone, what the Ouroboros had revealed to me, the creature inside myself, the creature full of hate and regret and love and sacrifice, the creature that could be cruel and brave, sorrowful and joyous. I gave him me, as no one but him would ever see me. No one but him would ever understand. You gave him yourself for Christmas? I had to flip the page back and forth because I was like, wait, did she seriously give him a giant ass painting of herself? Speaking as somebody who doesn't typically care for material things, this is like the worst gift to give someone. But then it's time for Rhysand to give his gift to Feyre. Feyre says, I know high ladies are probably supposed to wear a new dress every day, but I'm rather attached to this one. You never told me where you got it, where you got all my favorite dresses. Reese arched a dark brow. You never figured it out? My mother made them. I went still. Reese smiled sadly at the shimmering gown. She was a seamstress back at the camp where she had been raised. She didn't just do the work because she was ordered to. She did it because she loved it. And when she made Made it my father, she continued. I grazed a reverent hand down my sleeve. I, I had no idea. His eyes were star bright. Long ago, when I was still a boy, she made them. All your gowns, a trussel for my future bride. His throat bobbed. Every piece, dot, dot, dot. Every piece I have ever given you to wear, she made them for you. So you're telling me that the dresses that you guys have been fucking in are the same dresses that his mom has made? I don't know about that. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know. Sounds kind of weird. So you're telling me that if we read back all the sex scenes that they had and all the times that he ripped off her dress, he's actually ripping off his mom's dress? <sighs> I don't know about that, chief. Finally, we get to the end. It's literally like the last 50 pages of the book and we finally get a sex scene. So the author at this point is like, all right, this is the final sex scene. I gotta come up with something that is so out of this world. The dick is so good. It's gotta be like the best mind-blowing sex that you will ever read. And so she wrote this. One arm braced on the wall, the other holding me aloft. Reese met my eyes. How shall it be, mate? In his stare, I could have sworn galaxies swirled. In the shadows between his wings, the glorious depths of the night dwell. Hard enough to make the pictures fall off, I reminded him, breathless. So, you know, it kind of starts off normal where she's like, hey, I want you to bang me hard enough so that there's another earthquake. Every time, he gritted out. Every time you feel exquisite. 
And then it goes on and on where they're just banging it out. But they have this power where they're able to send each other's images of what they see. He let me in instantly, mind to mind and soul to soul. And then I was looking through his eyes, looking down at me as he gripped my hip and thrust. He purred, look at how I fuck you, Farah. Gods was my only answer. Mental hands ran along my mind, my soul. Look at how perfectly we fit. Stars flickered around us, sweet darkness sweeping in, as if we were the only souls in the galaxy. And still Reese remained before me, my legs wrapped around his waist. I brushed my own mental hands down him and breathed, can you fuck me in here too? That wicked delight faltered, went silent. The stars and darkness paused too. Then undiluted, utter predator answered, it would be my pleasure. And then I didn't have the words for what happened. Spoiler alert, me neither. He gave me everything I wanted. The unleashing pounding of him inside my body. The unrelenting thrust and filling and slap of skin on skin. The slam of our bodies against wood. Night singing all around us. Stars sweeping by like snow. And then there was us. Mind to mind, laying out on that bridge between our souls. We had no bodies here, but I felt him as he seduced me. His dark power wrapping around mine, licking at my flames, sucking on my ice, scraping claws against my own. I I felt him as his power blended with mine, ebbing and flowing in and out until my magic lashed out, latching onto him, both of us raging and burning together. He was roaring and my mortal body clenched around him, shattering. Then I shattered. Everything I was rupturing into stars and galaxies and comets, nothing but pure shining joy. Reese held me, enveloped me, his darkness absorbing the light that sparkled and blasted, keeping me whole, keeping me together. Bruh. <coughs> this author really wanted to amp it up. This isn't just physical sex anymore. Now the dick is so good, you're about to astral project out of your asshole. Farrah's like, no, 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 no. Don't even have sex with me in this realm. Have sex with me in a whole nother realm. I want to go to a whole different dimension. <gasps> Top it off, Feyre decides to give one last gift to him while they mate. When my mind could form words, when I could again feel his essence around me, his body still moving in my own, I sent him that image one last time into the darkest stars. My gift. Perhaps our gift one day. Reese spilled into me with a roar, his wings splaying wide. He remained buried in me, leaning heavily against the wall as he panted against my neck. Feyre, Feyre, Feyre. He was shaking. We both were. So you're probably wondering, what kind of image did she send to him that would make him explode and have such an extreme reaction? Unable to move for a good long while, the image of my gift remained between us, shimmering as bright as any star. That beautiful, blue-eyed, dark-haired boy that the bone carver had once shown me. That promise of the future. She sent him a picture of their future unborn son, and he climaxed. <sighs> I don't know about that. I don't know about that, she. First, he reveals that he's been giving Farah all of his mom's dresses, and now he's climaxing at the image of their future son. I don't know about that, cheap. The book ends with Farah opening up her own artist studio so that she can teach other artists in the community and build a new generation of artists who will have very shitty paintings. That is the last thing that I will leave off on. I mean, there's still more to the rest of the book because at the end here, there's a section that says, the Court of Thorns and Roses series will continue. Read on for a sneak peek of the next book. No, I did not read on to that sneak peek because there are some things where you, you just gotta wait it out, you know? I don't know when she's gonna publish that next book. Frankly, I didn't even know she was gonna write more books, but here we are. I think that if the series were to continue, it would follow Nesta and Cassian. Again, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Let's hope that bridge fucking burns. <laughs> Please don't ask me to read her other books because I will not. I have been through enough for you guys, okay? Don't forget to unsubscribe.